George Kilpatrick, Inspiration for the Nation, Celebrating People We Feel Good About. Brendan Slocum is the next featured author for the Friends of the Central Library author series. The book, this is not his latest book, but this is the first book, his debut novel, and everybody loved it. And, and it's, wait till you hear the, fat, the story about how he became an author. But uh, he's the author of The Violin uh, Conspiracy. And of course, uh, his latest book is, now I forgot the name of it. So go ahead, tell me. It is Symphony of Secrets. Yeah, I was going to say Symphony of Secrets. I was going to say that, but there we go. <laughs> so, uh, it's, called, it's right here in front of me. I don't know why I didn't just look at that. But uh, it's called Symphony of Secrets. So if you notice that there's a musical thing going on there, well, he absolutely has that going on because he's not only a writer, but when you look at his bio, writer is all the way down. He's first and foremost a musician. He's a classically trained violinist, but he also plays the viola. And so I'm trying to understand that because usually viola and violin, you got to choose what team you on. But he's like, I'm team both. So I got I to gotta understand that. Uh, my, wife, my daughter is a viola player, so I need to understand how you're doing both of those. He's also in a rock band. Okay, he's doing that. Uh, and he also, but his first love is is teaching. A graduate of UNCG, right, in Greensboro, North Carolina. Only reason why I'm giving that shout out is because my daughter uh, is a proud graduate of Bennett College. Uh, oh. You know what's up, you know what's up, you know what's up. <laughs> so, so with all of that being said, um, Brendan, welcome to the program. Uh, and let's let's do it, you know, your, your book, your debut novel, uh, was loved by so many people uh and it really uh goes into so i'm in the so i just started it so i know that the violin was very valuable and it was stolen and you're trying to figure out what happened so that's that's how we start that story but um before we get into the book let's get into you my brother right so you you were born in california but raised in north carolina and then went to school in north carolina how did that uh inform who you are uh well first thank you so much for having me here it's a pleasure to be here with you george i appreciate it um you know uh when when i was in elementary school uh there was a program that we could learn to play stringed instruments and i wasn't necessarily interested in learning to play a stringed instrument i was just wanting to get out of class twice a week mm -hmm. and i'm all about that so uh when i started playing the violin it uh I, I was doing well with it and it was fun and i loved it and my teacher saw that something was working something clicked and uh, i continued through junior high and high school and my, my uh, high school teacher um advised me to audition for unc and i had zero intention of going to college and i was like all right sure i'll do that and i auditioned and got in you know, my, my first teacher told me that my hands were too big to ever play violin in tune, that he couldn't teach me. And then, you know, we got a good teacher and she taught me everything I know. And I, I based one of the characters in the violin conspiracy on her. Really, really. And 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 so the rest is history. So so you 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 went to UNCG. So did you get a scholarship to go to uh, UNCG? Yeah, I got a small scholarship. You know, I didn't have a ton of money, but I, I, I did actually manage to to finagle a small scholarship. I, I asked that in the because when you said you auditioned, I didn't know that you were. I'm thinking was it was because there was a music program there. That is that why you had to audition? Yeah, um, I auditioned to be a music major in the school of music there. Um, you know, just. I uh, figured it was something that I, I might have an interest in doing, and my teacher was right to push me into doing that. I asked, and, and that's why I was asking if it, if the audition was connected to getting a scholarship to yes. the school. Okay, all right, that's absolutely. We, we, we're we're connecting all the dots here, <laughs> and, and and so you did that, graduated, uh, and so when did you pick up the viola? Did because again, you it's usually you proficient on violin, and that's about it. What about where did this viola thing come in? Oh well, the first time I picked up a viola was my senior year in high school. My my teacher said, you know, you're probably going to need to learn how to do this and read alto clef, you know, if you're going to major in music. Oh, okay, sure, why not? It was just something fun. I, I picked it up in high school. I, I sort of learned to read alto clef, 
And when I was in college, um, you know, I just wanted to learn everything I could. And I started taking viola lessons. So I was a double major. And and the rest is history. My daughter, again, uh, did viola all through high school, played in the um, the, the pit band uh, mm-hmm. for for all of, for for all the musicals, so uh, uh, it's really a, a a lot of fun. And so, uh, what I what I'm noticing about what you're really promoting, or at least what's coming up in the work that I've been able to investigate or interrogate so far, is that you're um, really about exposing kids to all genres of music. And let me tell you why that's so funny. So. As part of the violin conspiracy, there's a suggested playlist, right? So here's what happens. I'm listening to the playlist and all of a sudden the Beastie Boys come in, right? So I'm looking, I was like, do I still have, is this still the, it's still the right? So, so help me out with that, right? This idea of exposure, because I know that right, like right now, there's a lot of, um, a lot of conversation about, uh, black folk and classical music and and and, and orchestras and uh, I forgot the name of this. There's a project right now nationally to getting um, more black folk into uh, concert music and orchestras. I forgot what the name of it's called. What this is a national project uh, right now. Yeah, I I don't recall. I, it's right on the tip of my tongue. I right, know. right. It, like yeah. like twenty minutes from now, or fifteen minutes from now. Oh yeah, it's the name of that's the thing. I'm right? gonna shoot you an email and be like, yeah, George, it's blah blah blah. Yeah. Right, 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 right. So so with that being said, um, I know that that's important for you to at least talk about you as a black man and 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 music and not shying away from that conversation and that questions. Right. I I think that's very important. And you mentioned exposure. It is so incredibly important. Uh, The reason that I got started with classical music is because of exposure. You know, just when when I was in elementary school, uh, the first time I heard any classical music, my teacher played a snippet of a Mozart symphony. And it was one of the best things I'd ever heard. And, you know, we'd always grown up with all different types of music in my house and, you know, everything from Stevie Wonder to Kansas to Mm -hmm. ABBA to, Mm -hmm. you know, the OJ, everything, everything. And, you know, classical just kind of wasn't in the mix. Um, But I, I, I really want people to understand that it is for everybody. It's not just for a specific zip code or specific, you know, bank account. You don't have to look a certain way to enjoy it. And we shouldn't be afraid to expose our kids to, n- no, not just one type of music, but everything. If they're going to listen to hip hop, you know, throw Mozart in there, throw Vivaldi in there as well. You know, throw some jazz in, some bluegrass, some rock, everything. You know, it's interesting because when I hear about all of these ways to expose uh young children uh to music especially uh i'm talking about i'm particularly concerned about uh black folk but we're talking about all children who uh need this exposure but i'm particularly talking about exposing black folk it's very interesting because it, it it seems as though we think that we have to do something else with it for our kids to be interested in it as opposed to just presenting it as it is and allow that beauty in and of itself uh, to permeate. What are your thoughts about that? I, I think you're right. I think uh, there's an over dependence on, you know, it's it's got to be hip hop oriented. And don't get me wrong, there, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's fantastic. I think it's extremely creative. But, you know, I don't I don't like it when when people exclusively try to, for lack of a better term, water it down so that we can appreciate it. You know, um, I think we are totally capable of appreciating it as is. And then, you know, once you get the feel for it, once you do have that appreciation for it, you know, you can be creative and add as much stuff to it as you want. You know, I, I love playing Vivaldi as is. You throw a beat behind it, you know, I'm in heaven. It's it's amazing right. to me and the, I want to do that. But in order to be able to really appreciate it, you know, you, you need to have it in its original form. Uh, I think there was, uh, as I was listening to, as you, as I was being inspired uh, <laughs> by, by, by your book and what your conversations about the book, um, I, there was a, I think it was a Spanish influenced piece that really like spoke to me i can't think of the name of it uh on your playlist but uh and then of course vivaldi and mozart uh and all of the classics and um we 
you know, people don't realize that we're not new to this game uh, of classical music, right? You know, you think about all the way back to like Saint George and and, and people like that, and uh, more contemporary composers. Uh, we're not, we're not new in this genre. Is it because we're just not um, noticed or exposed? What what is it about us in this genre? Personally, I think it's because people don't feel like you mentioned it earlier. I just people sometimes don't think that we are up to appreciating it. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it's 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 we've always been in it. It's always been there. You know, when William Grant still was writing music for the show Perry Mason, you know, back in the 50s. And you know, people were playing his music and listening to it all the time, but they just didn't realize it. You know, I, I, people have this concept that classical music is an elitist activity, and it, it's really not. It's it's for everyone, and it always has been. You know, it, it, so you are you telling me that that beginning those, those strings that used to scare me when I was alone as a, as a child, run uh, watching Perry Mason. That was composed, that music was composed by William Grant Still. Is that what you're telling me? I, I'm not going to say the opening theme was by William Grant Still, but okay. you know, the, the the soundtrack during the show, you know, there's a lot of music. I'm a Perry Mason fan. I watch every episode, you know, just it's a, hey, it's a good thing that we got Hulu and HBO and stuff because I watch it all the time. Uh, but there are, I was watching one episode one day. And I was like, wow, this background music sounds a lot like William Grant Still. And I looked it up and sure enough, he composed for season. He did all the background music for uh, Perry Mason and everything that you hear after the opening credits is by William Grant Still. You know, when I listen to the Afro-American Symphony, it reminds me of, 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 of Porgy and Bess, but oh, that was before Porgy and Bess. So somebody yeah. was influenced by somebody, okay? Oh, we, know, we know what was up, we know Okay. What <laughs> <laughs> We're talking with Brendan Slocum, his book is called The Violin Conspiracy. He is a music, he's a musician, a music educator. Uh, and in this third thing, he says he's a writer, which I'm just trying to figure out so you're in the pandemic and you, you know, you can't go, you can't play anywhere. So you say, oh, I'll just write a book. And then, then the book is like loved by everyone. And like, did you even write an essay before this? Did you even write a short story before this? How do you sit down and write a 300 plays book and ain't never, as far as I can see, wrote anything before this? Okay, so uh, I had actually written a few things uh, okay. some a number of years prior, but uh, I really had time during the pandemic, like you mentioned, I, you know, wasn't playing anywhere and, you know, my lessons were canceled and, and all the recitals and rehearsals and concerts, everything just stopped. And I had plenty of time to focus on writing. I had written a um, science fiction novel like 20 years ago. Okay. It is awful. And I'm going <laughs> to rewrite it one of these days. And, and, and you know, I, I, in, in terms of my writing, I take a lot of advice. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I'm a very technical writer. And mm -hmm. when when someone says this doesn't make sense to me, or I need more, okay, that gives me an opportunity to, okay, I'm going to expand creatively, I'm going to use a ton of imagery and metaphors here, I can do that here, while still giving you the, the basic subject, which is a musical theme for me. Um, I, I like to stay within I was given fantastic advice, write what you know, and I know music, I don't know science fiction, I like to read it, but I do not know how to write it well. So um, yeah, music is is the way for me to go. And, you know, it, it's kind of easy for me to do that. You're an avid reader. So I'm sure that that informed uh, so you have a vocabulary and you did force me to go to the thesaurus a couple of times. So <laughs> I'm trying to see what's up with that. But because you are, um, you have lyrical, I mean, you're, you're lyrical uh, in some sense, right? How does that, um, you know, reading and um, um, playing music, how did that, inf what I'm trying to say is, did that, influence the style of writing were you looking for a certain rhythm a certain beat uh that reminded you of some of the things that you may have played or inspired by did you think in those terms when you were writing believe it or not i i really feel like that comes naturally you know i don't i don't really necessarily think about it but when i'm playing a piece of music you know the the, mm -hmm. the rhythm the tone the the tempo everything is there 
Mm-hmm. And as I'm practicing it, you know, that's that's what I work towards. I, I focus on one thing at a time. And in the writing, they it just kind of bleeds over. It's the same thing. I, I look at writing the same way I look at learning a new piece of music. You start mm-hmm. with, you know, an overture and then a climax and then a, you know, the finale. That's how I like to look at it with with pacing and everything. And, you know, I, I ask people, hey, read this for me. Tell me what you think. Is this boring? Are you bored at any point? You know, what does what needs to be bumped up? And, you know, I, I, I do that in my practicing as well. It's like, so how does this sound? You know, can should I do this faster, slower, louder? What do you think? And uh, yeah, I just I just take all the feedback I get. And and then you end up as a best selling author. So <laughs> <laughs> that so so this book is based on I, I heard you say that a lot of it, uh, it's not a memoir, but it could be right. It could be. It'll, it'll be. It's it's going to be a small part of the memoir that I'm going to write one of these days. Yeah. And, and so this story. So let's tell people what the book is about. Yeah. OK. The Violin Conspiracy is a story of a young man named Ray who discovers that his old family fiddle is actually a priceless Stradivarius violin. Mm-hmm. And this discovery catapults him into superstardom in the world of classical music. And right before the Tchaikovsky competition, which is basically the Olympics of classical music, his violin is stolen. Will he get it back? Will he get to compete? Will he win? Who took it? Was it his teacher who might be a little bit jealous? Was it his family who thinks that he should sell the instrument so they could split 10 million bucks? Was it the Marx family? Family whose great great grandfather used to own Ray's great great grandfather, and they say that he was he stole the instrument from them. You got to read it to find out. Yeah, uh, and I haven't found out yet. So, <laughs> <laughs> but this was based on uh, a, a priceless uh, violin that uh, that that you owned. What happened to yours? Oh man, uh, the the violin that I owned was a 1953 Eugene Lehman violin. That uh, it was the it was the instrument that was supposed to take me to college and start my professional career, and it was stolen. Yeah, I, I don't know if you've ever had. Hopefully not. Your home your home has been burglar. absolutely happened to me. Yes, so, so you know exactly when you walk in that something is not right. Right. And, I looked past all the, you know, thrown over furniture and and stuff that wasn't there. And I went straight to my hiding spot for my violin. I looked, it wasn't there. I looked again, it wasn't there. I walked out of the room and I walked back in and it wasn't there. And, you know, I know exactly what it's like to have something that is so, you know, that you treasure so much just to be ripped away from you. And, that, you know, it, it was cathartic for me to be able to kind of write that. And somebody's playing on my violin right now. I hope they're enjoying it. Mm. What's taking you more places, your writing or your music? Oh, wow. Oh, great question. Ooh. Um, well, I've only been a, a published author for a couple of years now. And, you know, I've been a violinist since I was nine years old. Um, I, I'm going to have to go with the music so far because when the writing allows me to sit next to Stevie Wonder and play, uh, then it'll it'll that'll be uh, the topper. But you know, my violin has taken me across the world, and you know, I I, I played in sold out arenas with with Stevie Wonder, and you know, I, I've played in Asia, in Hong Kong, in the Philippines, and you know, it's just it, it, I'm gonna go with the music right now. But it, but it's gaining, right? I mean, you are. Oh yeah. You you you're getting a lot of love. Are you? How, I mean, what did you expect ha- to happen when you wrote this book? Were you hoping for all of this? Or you was like, eh, I'm just going to put this out. I mean, you, what did you want from this? I had zero expectations. You know, I'm, you, you think about it, and real, realistically, who would be interested in, in reading a book about a violin? You know, I, I've right. read books about violin. It's not particularly interesting to me. So, you know, I, I kept my expectations low, but as I was writing the book, I knew, I knew I said, there's something about this. This is a good story. Even if it was from someone else, you know, I would enjoy reading the story and having, being a violinist, I wanted it to be as authentic as possible. You know, there are with the terminology that I use and, you know, my friends who are musicians, I ran it by them. Tell me if there's anything that's inaccurate. You know, I sent it to my first violin teacher yeah, I just wanted her. I said, Hey, let me know. Is everything on the up and up? Yep. You nailed everything. And I, you know, I, I didn't really have any expectations, but I am so incredibly grateful for the love and support this book has received. By the way, I just want to remind people that you can watch here, Brendan, 
at the uh, Friends of the Central Library, November the 12th. It's a Tuesday night at the On Center in Syracuse, uh, downtown, 7.30. Get your tickets. Be there. Show Brendan uh, some love. Uh, make sure you, you come out and support him and make sure. And I wanted to get to one of the things that you you deal with some real world, uh, real life struggles and conflicts of, of Black men navigating the world, uh, whether it's with law enforcement, whether uh, I, I remember when the first interview, um, you're, you, you have a lot of insecurity about what this officer is thinking about you. And that also mirrors experiences that you've had. Absolutely. Um, you know, it, it, it's all about perspective. You know, when, when I would tell people that the things that happened to me, I would always get the same response. You're exaggerating. No, things like that don't happen. No, 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 you're mistaken. No, 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 you misunderstood. And I'm like, no, this is a true experience that I just had. This is what is happening to me. And I'm not really expecting you to get it because your perspective is totally different from mine, you know, a, as a white person or a white man you're never going to have to deal with the stuff that I've got to deal with on a daily basis, but don't try to negate what it is that I'm telling you. Don't invalidate what I'm saying because the experience is different from yours. And it's been really eye opening for a lot of people who do not have these experiences to see, wow, is that what it's really like for you? I can't say that's what it's like for everyone who looks like me. I can just tell you what it's like for me. And unfortunately, it's it's common. And um, it was very validating for people to say, hey, you know what? That same thing happened to me. I'm so glad you put that in there. Now people really get how it is. This is what we have to deal with on a regular basis. It's interesting. You talk about interactions with police and how those experiences were not positive. Yet you also feel like you have to uh, uh, qualify by saying, but you know, I love police. I'm going to call police. So how can you, how come you can't have that authentic experience and still right? Like you feel the tension around not being able to say what really happens. Yeah. Well, okay. So my thing is I, I don't judge everyone by the actions of a few. I don't right. want that to be done to me. So right. I'm not going to do that to everyone. You know, there, there's good and bad in everything and everyone. Not all cops are jerks. Some of them are. And that's just the reality that that we live with. Um, but, you know, I've, I've had a few good interactions with cops. You know, the cops were expecting me to be belligerent and cuss them out and do all of this crazy stuff. And when I wasn't, you know, oh, well, thank you so much for us. Like, well, why are you thanking me? Do you think <laughs> what this is how I'm supposed to act? Are you you're shocked because I'm acting like the way I'm supposed to? You know, I, I broke the law. I didn't put my signal on when I turned. So, you know, that's that's what this is what happens. It's no big deal. But, you know, I do appreciate you saying that, Mr. Police Officer. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get the ticket or not? I totally got the ticket and there was like a crowd of people, you know, there's like six cop cars there because I put my signal on. I, I didn't put my signal on and I turned and I guess they thought I was going to be a, a violent person, didn't want to receive the ticket. Did you have a gun pulled on you? I did when I was in Baton Rouge, Louisiana in the summer of 2000, just because I made an illegal lane change. This is pre-GPS you know, pre everything. And I was using a roadmap and it was a Sunday evening and the cop just decided oh, I'm going to be a jerk today. He pulled me over, pulled a gun on me, told me to get out of the car, get on my hands and knees, you know, because I made for an a signal change. turn yeah, for, for not yeah for an illegal lane change. Yeah. Illegal lane change. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Protecting society. <laughs> <laughs> We're glad you survived that. Yeah. I mean, because Right. I mean, especially yeah. what we what we were experiencing. So um, you, you write about um, uh, Ray and Ray is trying to things have Ray isn't necessarily all good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't tell him that. OK. All right. All right. But one of the themes you also Ray is also uh, what, what I read here is also a neurodivergent character. Why was it important for Ray to for you to identify Ray in that way. I, I think you're uh bleeding into Symphony of Secrets with I'm my sorry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, with, yeah. with my character Josephine in Symphony okay. of Secrets. Uh that was important to me because uh and I I've been a teacher for a little over two decades and 
I've taught students who live with autism. My my one of my nephews has autism. My best friend's brother lives with autism, you know, and 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 I play with, you know, people in the symphony who have dealt with autism. And I the things that I've read don't really match up with my experiences and what I've seen. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I wanted uh, people to know that people living with autism, they, they can have very, very positive experiences. And I wanted the people who live with autism to see themselves in a story in a positive way. And uh, I think the character of Josephine allows people to, one lady actually told me after I read this story, I cried because I saw my daughter for the first time. And I, I, I feel now that people will actually be able to see past the behavior, see past, you know, what she says and actually see her as a person. How important, I mean, you're an avid reader, you love mysteries, that, from what I understand. Um, how important were libraries to you and how... <laughs> what, 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 what did libraries represent for you in your life? Everything. I, and, and, you know, I, I asked my mom, um, mom, was it me or did we go to the library a lot when I, when I was a kid? And she said it was the best free thing that we could do as a family. Every other Saturday, we would go to the library, my siblings and I, and we would come back with a stack of books. And, you know, we would race to see who was going to get through all of them. I, I, you know, would get books on science, birds, dinosaurs, flowers, trees, sea animal, everything. And, you know, my older brother would always get books on, on airplanes. And he ended up joining the military and he's retired from the military now. And he can tell you everything about every airplane that's ever been built. And he can tell you about my favorite airplane, the A-10 Warthog, which is now decommissioned. See, I know this stuff because I read about the airplanes. Mm -hmm. and, you know, my sister getting medical books and stuff. And my youngest brother, he just wanted to do whatever the rest of us were doing. And libraries were extremely important. Um, my my mom was instilling in us uh, the love of reading and we, we didn't even know it. We just thought, you know, okay, this is what you do. You go and you get this stuff. And we were getting smarter and smarter and smarter. Had no idea. She pulled a fast one on us. And, you know, we were all grateful for it. Grateful to mom for that. I know you also are a really big advocate of public school music programs. And when we think about uh, how music has impacted your life, uh, what do you want to say to those schools who may be thinking about cutting back? Uh, their music program and how a life can be saved. Oh my gosh. Wow. I, we don't have enough time on the show for me to go all into it, but creativity is extremely important. All the technological advances we have all stem from creativity. Um, that kid who's always running around and can't sit still in the corner. He needs a creative outlet. That girl who's always singing to herself. She needs a creative outlet. Um, not everyone is on the doctor, lawyer, engineer track. Not every, it's not for everyone. Arts are so incredibly important. It, it provides us with outlets that we all need. Everything around us is arts. Everything, everything we see, everything we hear is art in some form. And to take that away, to deny that from a child, from anyone, actually, it, it should be a crime. Um, just uh, those schools, if you're thinking about cutting something, don't put your arts programs on the chopping block first. You're you have no idea how incredibly important it is for so many kids. I'm living proof that that music saves lives. I would be in prison or I'd be dead right now if I did not have my violin, my strings program, something to keep me out of trouble. And and that is and, and there are people that you grew up with, right? Okay. That are exactly as you said, they're either in prison or dead. And so we definitely understand and recognize that. Well. Uh, Brendan, uh, oh, last thing, you work out. So what's the workout routine? <laughs> uh, uh, it's in the morning after I get up and I take a shower. I go to the gym in my apartment complex, cardio, abs, either chest, back, arms. I make sure I get them all in there at some point, but definitely abs and cardio every day. I'm going to be one of the hottest 52-year-olds on the beach this summer. So how much how much cardio and how much abs? We well, we want to know. Uh, I do at least uh, I do several versions of crunches. Uh, once I hit one hundred, I'm like, okay, um, that you know that's about all I can handle. Um, and cardio, I'm on the treadmill. All right, all right. Well, there you go. Well, you know what? 
uh, we don't want y'all to be on the treadmill. We want you to head on down to the On Center Tuesday, this Tuesday, the 12th of November, 7.30. Brendan will be giving his talk uh, at the as part of the Friends of the Central Library author series. I should mention that I'm also a member of the Friends of the Central Library Board. So I'm happy to have Brendan here uh, to give us a little taste of what we might experience on Tuesday night. Brendan, what a pleasure to talk to you. Continued success. Uh, as a writer, Symphony of Secrets is the latest book out. Get it. It'll be available also on Tuesday night. Also, The Violent Conspiracy. Both his books will be available there for you to buy it. And I got to, I got to, I got to, I have to send my wife so you can sign my book. So, <laughs> Done. Since, since I will be away. But listen, have a great uh, talk. Brendan, what a pleasure it is to talk to you. And we wish you all the success. And 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 maybe we'll hear you play one. Uh, that would be the next move. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I got to practice, but it, it'll happen. It'll happen. We, we, we we've got a, a classical. We got a symphoria. I'm on that board too, so we can make it happen. You hey. know what I mean? <laughs> I got you. I got you. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is Brendan Slocum again, Friends of Central Library, Tuesday, November 12th. Inspiration for the Nation.